Hi everyone, this is Arnie. I would like to give you a short walkthrough of the interactive periodic table of atomic orbitals that is to be found here on the quicycle.com website. It is found under the tools menu, click on periodic table and there you have it. What I'd like to do is walk you through the first 10 elements or so of the periodic table, just to give you a sense about atomic orbitals and how the electrons associate with the atoms and the geometries that they create and why. If you scroll down underneath the periodic table, you will see several things. A, wherever you see this little icon, that represents something that you can click on in order to see the structures and play with them and rotate them and move them around, etc. This key shows you how to understand the structures that are found on this periodic table. For example, a wireframe with a light coloring like this represents a single electron inside of an orbital. In this case, it's a sphere shape, and that dot is the nucleus in the center of the atom. If it's a brightly colored orbital like this, it contains two electrons that are superimposed, also known as a dielectron, and we'll talk more about that in a moment. When we show some of the larger atoms, these circles that represent single electrons uh, are not meant to imply that the electrons actually form spherical regions. Those are just representing the directions of the electron density around the atom. But in fact, if you look down at this image beneath, you will see that these directions are normally rendered as lobe shapes like this that contain the electron density. Uh, we believe that it's more realistic to consider the shell of electron density divided up into four equal slices. And the electron density will be the highest around the center of the face, and it'll taper off, and electron density will be the least on the nodal boundaries that separate these orbitals from one another. If we scroll down further, there's some links to seeing some specific molecules. There are some periodic trends, just describing how different atomic properties change as you go across or down the periodic table some chemistry definitions, a little bit more, an interesting uh, course on some platonic geometry, and a brief introduction to a new theory about uh, atomic electron orbitals and magnetism called subquantum chemistry. But that is something for a different conversation. So before we jump in to the first 10 elements, I do want to just draw your attention to this link right here called Understanding Electrons. Uh, and that is a short little piece describing what electrons actually are. So I thought that would probably be a good place to start now also. Most people believe that electrons are point particles with no real substructure, but that is not the case. The work of John Williamson, Martin van der Mark, Vivian Robinson has recently clarified the substructure of the electron and why it has the properties that it has as a result. So what an electron is, is imagine a photon of light that instead of traveling in a straight line, were to become confined in a double loop rotation. That means that for every wavelength, it goes around the circle twice. So it traces a toroidal, a donut shaped path in momentum space. Now this image is a little confusing because it's really two images in one. The toroidal path around the outside shows the path of the photon of light that is trapped in a circular path that constitutes the electron. And the reason that it goes around twice for every wavelength is because then when it comes around for the second time, the electric and magnetic fields, which are designated with these green and blue uh, spines, the electric and magnetic fields are perfectly in phase, perfectly aligned with themselves when they arrive back at the same point after two revolutions. And then the photon literally locks into itself and creates a self-sustaining double loop rotation. And that is constitutes the particle. A particle, a subatomic particle, is therefore a dense knot of electromagnetic radiation traveling around in a knot or a circle of some description of another. So that is fascinating work. Uh, what's also very interesting is the interactions between electrons is that in atoms, electrons form stationary waves. They form single coherent harmonic systems where every part is part, every aspect of it is part of that entire unity. And if one aspect of it is damaged or destroyed, the whole wave structure will change. Now, this image here is really a linear wave on a string, on a vibrating string. And you'll see that even though it divides itself into two nodal regions, 
it looks almost as if each section is staying where it is, and therefore it's called a stationary wave. Now, in the electrons around atoms form spherical stationary waves, if you will. So we see those same standing wave structures in each shell, in each concentric shell of the atom, and they do create symmetrical wave structures, but the geometries are actually different depending on how many wave structures are there they are in each shell for example this string has two imagine a string that had three bumps instead of two similarly each spherical orbital in the atom can have three or four or five or six different uh, lobes now without going into too much detail then there are five different electron interactions which are spoken right here and i will leave that to you to look at in more detail if you are interested i do just want to briefly mention the first one this is called dielectron formation or an electron pair or a lone pair formation uh, all electrons spin as if they are left-handed meaning if the north pole is pointing up and you're looking at it from the top, it looks like it's circulating in a clockwise direction. But that electron can jump into the anti-parallel direction. It's still going left-handed, just pointing downward. And when it does that, the magnetic fields in between are aligned in opposite directions, and they therefore cancel each other out. And that lowers the energy in between, and that's a very attractive state for the electrons because they prefer lower energy and that pulls them towards that lower energy state and they get attracted toward one another and if they are able to they will superimpose completely upon one another and that means that at every point in this volume of space the two magnetic fields are aligned in equal and opposite directions and they cancel each other out which means that when a dielectron forms the magnetic energy which is stronger than the electrostatic energy the magnetic energy is cancelled to a very large degree, and that lowers energy, which makes this dielectron an extremely favorable state for electrons, and they will always opt to do it if they are able to do it. Now, this picture at the bottom represents the helium atom, because the helium atom has two electrons in the same space, which forms a dielectron. This is the hydrogen molecule. Each hydrogen atom is contributing one electron, and when they get together, you have a pair of electrons that are superimposed, and that's also a dielectron, except it contains two atomic nuclei in the center instead of one in the case of helium. So a lot of this theory of subquantum chemistry is surrounding the interactions between single electrons and unpaired electrons, and you are free to browse further down the page if you're interested to learn more about that. But we'll now return to the periodic table. So let's jump right in. The first element is hydrogen. So if we click on hydrogen, we will see that hydrogen has one proton in the center. A proton is positively charged. And the reason hydrogen is element number one is because it contains one proton. That's called the atomic number. Uh, the atomic mass is also one. Hydrogen has a single electron. Electrons are negative. So the reason it has an electron is because it is attracted there by the positive proton. So here's the proton. This represents a single electron, and when you add them together, that electron envelops the nucleus. It wraps itself around the nucleus in a spherical charge field so that it neutralizes the positive charge in every direction around the proton. Now, it's important to realize that this electron is not usually larger than a proton. An electron can be very small when it's isolated, traveling by itself, but when an electron joins an atom, it becomes part of a much larger quantum system and therefore an electron itself can be this in the hydrogen atom the electron is the size of the hydrogen atom itself this is a a strange idea but feel free to look at some of the links that i shared on that understanding electrons page if you'd like to delve into that further anyway uh, electrons do not really contribute much mass to the atom at all and we tend to usually ignore it when we are counting the atomic mass so the atomic mass is really just from the protons and the neutrons together and since hydrogen doesn't have any neutrons usually its atomic mass is one so hydrogen has one proton in the center so it attracts one electron now we call the electron configuration of hydrogen 1s1 one stands for the first shell this only has one shell s represents the an s orbital which is a sphere shaped orbital and the superscript little one shows how many electrons there are in that orbital so this is a first shell s orbital containing a single electron and if you click on this link right here it will open a 
calc plot, a 3D calc plot page, where you can see the simple mathematical formula that just describes a simple sphere, but you can zoom in and out and you can uh, you know, drag it around to look at this from different directions. That's obviously not very interesting on a simple sphere, but when we get to more complex atoms, that might be more interesting to look at. Uh, this is just a simple glossy version of that same spherical hydrogen atom. Uh, one thing I will note is that the nucleus in the center is greatly exaggerated in size in this image. If this was accurate to size, then if the nucleus, if the atom as a whole was the size of a large football stadium, then the nucleus in the center would be about the size of a penny placed in the middle of the center of the field, which would be barely visible from the stands, which just underscores how much smaller a nucleus is than the entire atom. So hydrogen only has one electron, and therefore it's very eager to keep that one electron, and that means that it has a high ionization energy. It has a large amount of energy required to steal that electron away from the hydrogen atom. Now, the rest of the page continues with some more general information, um, ion formation. I'm not going to go through all of it, but I will mention this one detail here. And that is that while a hydrogen atom has one proton and therefore it will have one electron so that the atom can be neutral overall. However, if hydrogen loses this electron, if another atom is able to steal it, then the hydrogen turns into a proton only. Uh, and that will have a positive charge because it has no electron to cancel the charge. And that is called a positive hydrogen ion. The term ion means that the electrons and the protons are imbalanced and therefore the atom has a charge overall. On the other hand, if this hydrogen atom gains an electron to make a dielectron, which is a very desirable electron state, if it gains an electron from an atom that's willing to lose one, then the hydrogen, the negative hydrogen ion called the hydride ion can form which is a di electron, and it has a negative charge because it now has two electrons, but only one proton. So this shows us that very often an atom will prefer to be an ion. It will prefer to have a charge if it means that its electrons are going to be more symmetrical or more complete. So that's obviously a much more important consideration for the atom energetically than for its charges to be balanced. This shows the formation of the hydrogen molecule, as we saw before two single hydrogen atoms connect and they form the hydrogen molecule, which is a dielectron with two nuclei in the center. And then here's a little bit more information about the hydrogen atom, its importance, um, some interesting reading, a little bit about the isotopes of hydrogen that actually do contain a neutron. Most hydrogen just has a proton in the center, but there's a few small percentage of hydrogen in the universe that also contains a neutron. So its mass will be two, that's called deuterium and two neutrons makes a mass of three, and that's called tritium. But most hydrogen just has a proton. And then there's a little bit more general information. So now let us continue on with helium, element number two. Helium is element number two because it has two protons. But helium also has two neutrons, and the reason is because neutrons are required to keep the protons from repelling each other and flying apart because neutrons actually bind protons together. And I encourage you to look at Dr. Vivian Robinson's lecture on that subject on the Quisicle website. It's fascinating stuff. So as a result of two protons and two neutrons, helium has a mass of four. Because of the two protons that are positive, it attracts two electrons that are negative to make a neutral atom. So helium's electron configuration is 1s2, one shell, an s orbital containing two electrons, a dielectron, in fact. Here's just another view of that glossy version of the dielectron. And here's a little information about the nucleus of helium, that it makes an alpha particle as two protons and two neutrons bind to each other. And here is a link to the Robinson model of nuclear binding, which I encourage you to look at, because it is the first theory that I've come across that actually explains how protons and neutrons can bond to each other if protons are positive and neutrons are neutral. So that's fascinating stuff. Moving on to the next element is lithium. Now, lithium is the first element on the second row of the periodic table. That means it has a second shell. The first shell has two electrons in it, so this first shell dielectron is now full of electron density and is not willing to accept any more electrons into that space. So the next electron that shows up is forced to make a sphere shape of electron density around that inner shell, because that's as close as it can get to the attraction of the nucleus. 
Now, because that outer electron is not a dielectron, it's not that stable, which means that lithium would actually prefer to lose that electron because if it does, it forms a dielectron state, which is very stable, which will then obviously have a positive charge because now it has three protons, but only two electrons. Moving on to the next element, which is beryllium. Beryllium has four protons and therefore four electrons. So its electron configuration is 1s2, 2s2. The first shell is an s sphere-shaped orbital with two electrons. The second shell is also a sphere-shaped s orbital with two electrons in it, both dielectrons, a dielectron within a dielectron. So beryllium is therefore a little bit more stable than lithium is though it will still be able to lose its two outer electrons to form the two plus ion in certain circumstances. Now boron is very interesting because now we have put a fifth electron around this atom, an atom which has a dielectron within a dielectron. Now the problem is that you, cannot, you can still fit more electron density into the second shell because it's much larger than the first shell, but if you add another electron into the shell, it doesn't create a spherical structure. It creates a p orbital, and p orbitals take this three-directional structure. There are three directions, the x, y, and the z axis, if you prefer, and each direction will have two lobes, each lobe consisting of one electron's worth of electron density. So really, one, two, three, four, five, six p orbitals can accommodate six electrons. So you might argue that if there were six electrons, the p orbital would be symmetrical and well balanced. But when you add only one electron, it's not stable. So when boron takes its fifth electron, that electron does not simply just add into that second shell like this because it creates an unstable asymmetrical electron wave structure. And the electrons will resist that. So it has to figure out a way to create a symmetrical configuration. So what happens is something called hybridization. Those three electrons in the second shell of boron, the two electrons that made the outer dielectron and the other electron, the single electron from the P, they combine into three equivalent hybrid orbitals, they are called. And those three orbitals each contain one electron, and those electrons will move to be as far away from each other as they can get, because electrons will repel each other, unless they can form a dielectron. So boron creates this triangular electron geometry called trigonal planar. Now this is a more realistic view of that electron density, is that each that the entire second shell is now going to be divided into three equal longitudinal sections, like three watermelon slices worth of electron density. And the density will be highest in the center of the face, and the electron density will be lowest along the nodal lines that are the boundaries between the shells. And then there's just a little bit more detail about boron as a substance. If we move on to carbon, the next element, carbon has six electrons because it has six protons. Again, we now have two electrons in the first shell, two electrons in the s orbital of the second shell, and now two p electrons that we'd like to add into that second shell. As you can see, if I add one into each direction, it creates asymmetrical electrons, and therefore the electrons are going to want to hybridize again in order to create a symmetrical arrangement. So what they do is all four of the electrons, the two from the 2s and the two from the 2p, will rearrange themselves so that you can have four identical electrons, four identical hybrid orbitals, and now carbon will create this symmetrical tetrahedral arrangement where you have four directions where the sphere, the second shell, is divided into four equivalent orbital slices. And what that looks like and by the way, here we see this interactive link. If I click on this interactive link, it opens up the 3D Calc Plot website. And once again, I can zoom in. I can move the structure around if I want. I can pull it to the side so that it rotates. It just gives me an interesting way to investigate the geometry of that electron orbital structure. Um, now, this is going to be that more realistic view of these orbitals where the electron density will fill the entire shell of the second shell minus the shell on the inside because this electron density cannot penetrate the other electron density. There will be nodal lines separating these shells from one another. But the orbitals will divide themselves into four equal sections out of that volume. 
This shows the formation of the natural gas, the methane molecule, when four hydrogen atoms approach a carbon atom. Each of these single electrons will pair up and make a dielectron with one of carbon's single electrons, and it'll create these four dielectrons, which are the covalent bonds holding the molecule together, each with a hydrogen nucleus at its center. And it makes a perfectly symmetrical molecule, which is why methane is nonpolar. At the beginning, there's, at the bottom, there's just a little bit more information about carbon as it relates to the carbon cycle. Uh, the main point to be made here is that the most effective method for pulling carbon out of the atmosphere is photosynthesis. And therefore, if we are interested in climate change and protecting the planet, the first line of defense is stopping deforestation. Moving to the next element, which is nitrogen. Nitrogen has seven protons and therefore seven electrons. Two in the first shell, two in the second shell, and then another three more in that second shell in the p orbital. Now, once again, we can see that if those three p electrons added one in each direction, it would again be an asymmetrical situation. Even if they were flip-flopping back and forth on each side, that's not a symmetrical stable configuration. That's a flip-flopping one, which electrons do not do. Therefore, we will see hybridization occur again, where those two electrons in the di-electron uncouple from each other and they form hybrid four-directional hybrid orbitals. And therefore, one of them will now contain a di-electron and the other three will contain single electrons, which means nitrogen is looking for partners for only three of its four bonding directions in that second shell. And that is why nitrogen typically makes three bonds or the three minus ion. If it attracts three electrons, it gets to fill up those remaining three di-electron positions and therefore create a completely full stable outer shell, but then it'll have three more electrons than protons and hence a three minus charge. This is the formation of the ammonia molecule. This time three hydrogens are required, one for each unpaired electron on the nitrogen. And when they overlap to form the di-electron bond, that is the ammonia molecule. What's interesting and important to note here is that because nitrogen pulls electrons more strongly than hydrogen does, it has a higher electronegativity, that means that when they bond, all of this electron density is going to be pulled more strongly in the direction of the nitrogen side, making the nitrogen side feel a little negative, partially negative, and the hydrogens are going to feel partially positive because some of their electron density is being pulled away from them. And that creates a molecule that's polar. It feels negative on one end and positive on the other. And that gives it some very important properties in nature. Moving on to oxygen. Element number eight, eight protons and therefore eight electrons. Once again, we are only placing four electrons in the p orbital now. We have a 1s2, two electrons in the first shell. We have two electrons in the s orbital of the second shell and four electrons in the p orbital. And again, we cannot put just four directions in the P alone, so we're going to have to force all of those second shell electrons to combine and hybridize and make four directional symmetry, as we saw before. And this time, since we're placing six electrons into four boxes, two of them will be paired up and two of them will be unpaired. So we're going to have two di electrons and two unpaired electrons in the oxygen atom. And this is why oxygen makes the bonds and has the chemistry that it has. Oxygen can gain two electrons to fill those outer unpaired electron shells to create a double negative charge, or it can share electrons with two other atoms and form two covalent bonds as it does in the formation of water. Two hydrogen atoms each connect up with one of the single electrons in oxygen and it forms two dielectrons, two covalent bonds with two hydrogen atoms. Now, once again, Water has its properties because the oxygen end of this molecule is negatively charged and the hydrogen end is positively charged because oxygen pulls electrons more strongly than hydrogen, so it pulls them to this oxygen side. And as a result, water has many of its vitally important properties for life. Uh, at the bottom, there's a little bit more information about how oxygen reacts with hydrocarbons to burn and create water and carbon dioxide as the waste. And then there's a little bit more detail about oxygen's very interesting magnetic properties. Here you can see liquid oxygen actually sticking to a magnet instead of falling under the force of gravity. And that's interesting stuff to consider. And here's some information about ozone and it's also its interesting resonance structure. And 
there's a link to the quantum Lewis structure, which is part of this new subquantum chemistry theory, where we extend the Lewis dot structure in order to be able to account for uh, symmetri a single symmetrical resonance structure. But that's a conversation for another video. Element number nine is fluorine. Fluorine is nine protons and therefore nine electrons. Once again, it has one, two, or two electrons in the S of the first shell, two electrons in the S orbital of the second shell, and five P electrons in the second shell. Five out of six, once again, not symmetrical, and therefore the element will uncouple those two di electrons from the 2s and create seven electrons in four directions, which will make three pairs and one single, which is why fluorine has four directional symmetry, three of them are lone pairs, and only one of them is an unpaired electron, which means that fluorine is very eager to gain that last electron to pair up with that unpaired electron to create a full shell with four di electrons because that's incredibly stable. And as a result, fluorine has very extreme chemistry. It will very forcibly remove that electron from many different substances, and therefore it can sometimes be a very dangerous substance to work with. When it does gain one electron to fill that outer paired electron, it has a one minus charge because it has one extra electron compared to its protons. And finally, at the end of the second row, we have element number 10, which is neon, 10 protons, therefore 10 electrons. Now, uh, here, you might think that since we now have six electrons in the p orbital, and the p orbital can take six electrons, you would think that it should do so, and that it should form a six-directional, a three-directional symmetry, uh, as we have been discussing all along. But it is our contention that, in fact, it is far more stable for the atom to hybridize once again into four directions, because then you can have four di-electron states. It seems more reasonable that electrons will overlap and form di-electrons if they have the opportunity to do so, because that lowers energy in a dramatic fashion and makes them far more stable than they would be if all of these electrons were unpaired and occupying the same volume of space. Uh, so this is another representation of neon. It has a full outer shell of four di-electrons and no charge because it hasn't gained or lost any electrons. What's interesting is that if we go one shell lower on the periodic table, meaning if we add another full shell of four di-electrons around neon's four di-electrons, our contention here is that those di-electrons will align themselves in an anti-parallel fashion. The di-electron on the top will align itself where the other ones overlap and vice versa. Now you can see that on this glassy image where the center of the shell, the center of the electron density is at its highest at the center of the face of this orbital, and that lies directly above the, where the nodes meet on the shell inside of it, which is the point of lowest electron density on that inner shell. And therefore, the di-electrons will align this way because it minimizes electron repulsion. Once again, we see that here, where on the blue shell on the inside, this is the area of highest electron density, and it lies where these nodes meet, which is the point of lowest electron density on the outer shell. So now before we conclude, there are just one or two brief ideas that I would like to share about the periodic table. Uh, two substances I'd like to underscore. Number one is sodium. Sodium is the first element on the third shell. So sodium's electron configuration is two electrons in the first shell, eight electrons in the second shell, like neon, filling the second shell, and then the 11th electron has to now start a third shell, and it will add as a sphere, just like the other shells added their first electron as a sphere. Now, sodium would obviously be very eager to lose that outer electron because then it would be a stable full shell con configuration, though it would have a positive charge. Now, before I show you a reaction of that, let's look at chlorine, because sodium chloride we know is a famous pairing. Now, chlorine is the second last element on the third row. So like fluorine above it, it's one electron shy of filling its outer shell of four di electrons. So like fluorine, chlorine is very eager to gain one more electron. So if it did so, it would fill its outer shell to become like argon, but it would now have a one minus charge. So when sodium chloride forms, when salt forms, this is what actually happens. The sodium ion 
loses its electron to become the sodium. The sodium atom loses its outer electron to become the sodium ion. The chlorine atom gains that electron to become the, the chloride ion. And now we have sodium ions and chloride ions that are both stable with full shells. Neither of them is interested in gaining or losing any more electrons, but they have opposite charges, which means that they will attract each other, which they do. And they form a solid crystal structure of alternating pluses and minuses sticking to each other because of the opposite charges. Now, when you drop that into water, recall that water molecules are polar. They have negatives on one end and positives on the other end which means that water molecules will be able to tug at these ions, whether they're positives or negatives. And if they successfully pluck one of these ions off, notice how the oxygen side is, the, I mean, the positive side of the water molecule is hugging the negative ion, and it pulls it off. And when it does so, the rest of that ion just becomes surrounded by water molecules because their positives are going to be attracted to the negative in the center of the ion. Similarly, if the oxygen end, the negative end, of the water molecule is able to pluck a positive ion off of the crystal, it will similarly surround it with water molecules, but this time it will be the oxygen end, the negative end, crowding around the positive ion center. And that is the process of dissolving. When salts dissolve, they separate into separate ions surrounded by spheres of water. And if you leave a cup of salt water in the sun and you allow all of these water molecules to gradually evaporate, they will leave these ions exposed and those ions will just click back into place and the crystal will reform the way that it did before. And that's actually a fun activity to take a bucket of salt water or a cup of salt water, just let it stand out to dry and you'll see some beautiful salt crystals growing in the bottom. So I encourage you to uh, browse the rest of the periodic table and also the Quantum Bicycle Society website. There's a lot of very interesting lectures. I hope that you have found this interesting and feel free to browse and let us know if you have any comments or suggestions. Thanks very much.